Um, okay, so uh, just to begin here, um, I know that I said initially that we weren't going to do a vocab quiz this weekend. Um, I changed my mind about this because there is going to be some stuff that we're going to talk about today and that we talked about last time that I think that is important that I want you guys to remember. Um, so I was worried that if uh, I waited until after spring break to do a vocab quiz, it wouldn't reinforce it, right? You know, that we would, that would be kind of too, too much distance in time and you would have forgotten some of the stuff already. Um, so yeah, so we will still be having a vocab quiz, but you know, again, like, you know, these are, you know, as long as you're coming to class, paying attention, taking notes, these are not that big a deal, right? So um, does anybody have any questions about the exam or the paper. Everybody got their uh, um, their comments back on the proposals, right? So anybody have any questions about anything? Uh, you said you bring blue books for us, or do we have to go? I'll I'll provide blue books for you. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I know that they, they don't they don't cost very much, but I still think it's kind of bullshit that you have to buy your own if an instructor wants to use them. So yeah, it's you know. There are five people in this class. It'll cost me like two fifty. You know, it's, it's not. It's not that. Actually, I think it's one cent. What's that? I think it's one cent. Okay. Well, yeah. Then it'll cost me a nickel. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, I'm not worried about it. <laughs> so yeah, I'll, I'll provide those. I got a question. Shoot. Um, when you give us like a list of all the vocabulary words. Um. I will not. Um, you will still kind of have that. You'll just you'll have that. Um, uh, can you still access? Can you still see your quiz answers? No, you cannot. I don't think so. Okay. Um, hmm. All right. So so what, what what I'll do then is I'll see if I can open that back up for you, and then you can use that as a kind of study guide, right? So um, you're probably going to want to focus your attention on the things that we talked about the most in class, right? because those are the things that I'm going to regard as most important. Um, sometimes I'm just trying to get to 10 words. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, there, remember, remember there are only going to be 12 vocab words on the test, right? And you're only going to pick eight of them to, um, to define. Any other questions about the exam or about the paper? Yeah, the paper should cover the whole text, right? So for the response paper, I just want you to do in a single quote, right? Show me, show me that a pattern exists, right? But just show me a piece of it. For the paper, I want to see the whole pattern, and I want to see, you know, some explanation as to why you think it's significant, right? Like, what, what, is, what does this thing mean? Anything else? Okay, so um, I'm going to assume that most of you found Sarto Rosartus really confusing and kind of difficult to get through, right? Okay, it was very confusing, but like at the same time, it was kind of interesting. Okay. Like, well, some of the stuff that I know, but it's like, uh -huh. what are you saying, bro? Can you get to the point? <laughs> okay, so, so what, 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 what's the stuff you were able to hook on to here, Jamal? Um, when he was talking about Towards the end, when we're talking about the everlasting God, okay. and he was talking about accepting God and accepting just, uh, just focus on being alive, I guess. Mm hmm. But, like, I don't, know, I don't know how to explain it. Okay. I guess he's talking about different phases of his own spiritual awakening. Kind of yeah. That. Yeah. That, that, that actually is kind of exactly what's going on with this narrator um, in the portion of this that we're reading, right? So we're only reading a short excerpt here from a longer text. So that always makes it a little bit more confusing, right? Because you don't have the full context. Um, but yeah, um, in this particular excerpt, he's moving. From this phase, he calls the everlasting no through the center of indifference to the everlasting yay. Um, we'll define all of these uh, sort of as we go, right? 
Uh, was everybody able to figure out that there are two different voices talking here? Yeah, so the, the protagonist of Sartre vs. Sartus is an obscure German professor by the name of Diogenes Teufelsdruck, which, as I told you guys at the end of last class, right, Diogenes is Greek or God born, and Teufelsdruck is German for devil's shit. So, <clears throat> there are a couple of things going on even in this character's name, right? On the one hand, it's kind of a joke, right? It's meant to be funny. But, we're also kind of seeing here a dual nature within this character, right? The divine mixed with the grotesque, the filthy, and the disgusting, right? That's kind of typical of uh, some of Carlyle's concerns. Right. <clears throat> the divine and the physical, and the physical in particular its most disgusting aspects, right? Um, the other voice is the voice of an editor who is, uh, for all intents and purposes, the primary narrator of the piece, right? Or like the more conventional narrator. Essentially, there are two narratives going on simultaneously here. One narrative is Teufelsdruck's story. And his clothes philosophy. The other narrative is the editor's attempts to piece together Teufelsdruck's story and philosophy. In the beginning of the novel, which isn't excerpted here, uh, the editor receives um, on his doorstep a series of paper bags that are full of all these completely disorganized papers belonging to this German professor Diogenes Teufelsdruck. And so a big part of what's happening here is that this editor is trying to stitch together something coherent out of what Teufelsdruck has left behind, right? Just this messy jumble of papers, right? Putting them together into some kind of order. So, <clears throat> before I get any deeper into this, is there anything in particular that you guys found interesting or confusing here. Kind of the whole sequence. Okay. The sequence as in like what's what is literally happening? Like probably talks about his like transition between each of the different stages. Okay. And yeah, so th these transitions tend to happen at the end of each of the each of the sections, right? See, that part makes sense. When we start the next section, it's like, what's happening? Okay. <laughs> so let's okay. okay so so let, let's let's kind of start there, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, background material, and then we'll just see you know if we can kind of get back into this and dig a little bit more out, right? So the first section, the section labeled the everlasting no. Um, comes after a chapter 
that is on uh, Diogene, uh, Diogenes Teufelsdruck's schooling and his personal uh, disappointments, right? So he has been disappointed in love. Um, you know, the girl he loves has been taken away by his best friend. Um, and he has been educated in a system um, that he believes puts uh, the needs of the stomach over the needs of the soul. Uh, he's, the school he's gone to, he calls the Hinterschlag Gymnasium. Right, a gymnasium in German is just a high school, right? Tinterschlag means ass slap. So he has attended ass slap high school. The suggestion here being that one of the high school's primary means of education is corporal punishment. And the philosophy that he has learned here, he calls profit and loss philosophy. So to dig into this a little bit on page 35, right? Alas, shut out from hope in a deeper sense than we yet dream of. For as he wanders wearisomely through this world, he has now lost all tidings of another and higher. Full of religion, or at least of religiosity, as our friend has since exhibited himself, he hides not that in those days he was wholly irreligious. Doubt had darkened into unbelief, says he. Shade after shade goes grimly over your soul till you have the fixed starless Tartarian black. To such readers as have reflected, what can be called reflecting on man's life, and happily discovered, in contradiction to much profit and loss philosophy, speculative and practical, that soul is not synonymous with stomach. To understand, therefore, in our friend's words, that for man's well-being, faith is properly the one thing needful, how, with it, martyrs, otherwise weak, can cheerfully endure the shame and the cross, and without it, worldlings puke up their sick existence by suicide, in the midst of luxury. So we have this divide between the spiritual and the worldly or physical here, right? That faith in an idea enables martyrs to endure all sorts of torments, right? But the worldly sicken themselves on their luxuries, right? To such it will be clear that for a pure moral nature, the loss of his religious belief is the loss of everything. Unhappy young man, all wounds, the crush of long-continued destitution, the stab of false friendship and of false love, all wounds in thy so genial heart would have healed again had not its life warmth been withdrawn. Well might he exclaim in his wild way, is there no God then, but at best an absentee God, sitting idle ever since the first Sabbath at the outside of his universe and seeing it go? Has the word duty no meaning? Is what we call duty no divine messenger and guide but a false earthly phantasm made up of desire and fear of emanations from the gallows and from Dr. Graham's celestial bed? Happiness of an approving conscience. conscience. Did not Paul of Tarsus, whom admiring men have since named Saint, feel that he was the chief of sinners, and Nero of Rome, jocund in spirit, Volgamuth, spend much of his time in fiddling, Foolish wordmonger and motive grinder, who in thy logic mill hast an earthly mechanism for the godlike itself, and wouldst fain grind me out virtue from the husks of pleasure, I tell thee, nay, to the unregenerate Prometheus Vinctus of a man, it is ever the bitterest aggravation of his wretchedness that he is conscious of virtue, that he feels himself the victim not of suffering only, but of injustice. What then? Is the heroic inspiration that we name virtue but some passion, some bubble of the blood, bubbling in the direction others profit by. I know not, only this I know. If what thou namest happiness be our true aim, then are, we, then are we all astray. With stupidity and sound digestion, man may front much. But what, in these dull, unimaginative days, are the terrors of conscience to the diseases of the liver? Not on morality, but on cookery let us build our stronghold. 
There, brandishing our frying pan as censer, let us offer sweet incense to the devil and live at ease on the fat things he has provided for his elect. Okay, so this is long and confusing, right? But what it is, is a critique of a popular philosophical notion of the early 19th century, one that eventually becomes dominant in the Victorian period. So he talks about profit and loss philosophy. He's talking about a system that's called utilitarianism. Have any of you heard of utilitarianism before? Okay, does anybody know what it means, what a utilitarian believes? Yeah, it, it, it's a philosophy that's based on a particular idea of usefulness, right? So tenet number one of utilitarianism is that an idea must be judged by its usefulness. But the utilitarian idea of usefulness is a very specific one. Useful to a utilitarian means that something increases pleasure and or decreases pain. Something that makes people feel good is useful. Something that makes people feel bad is not useful. So by this logic, the most useful things are the things that can increase pleasure the most for the, well, for the largest number of people, right? So <clears throat> this meant that a lot of early utilitarians, particularly uh, Jeremy Bentham, who's regarded as the father of the school, argued that things like art, which could only really be enjoyed by um, a kind of educated elite, weren't particularly important. And that instead, we should encourage things like you know, the playing of simple games, um, which made more people happy. Um, and you know, just you know, making sure that everybody was fed. Right? Nothing wrong with making sure everybody's fed, right? But the attitude that Carlyle was taking to this, right, through Teufelsdruck, is that this isn't enough, right? That there is more to a human being than a stomach and the pleasure centers of the brain. And that profit and loss philosophy, utilitarianism, doesn't stimulate our higher functions in any way. Right? <clears throat> You're swimming in the shit and forgetting that you're God-born, right? Does this make sense? Everybody with me here? Okay. So there are a couple of ideas with which Carlyle in particular is associated that it might be a good idea to go over here now. Um, because all of this stuff is, is related and will help you understand what's going on here. So... The first is what we call um, the gospel of work, or what Victorian thinkers will come to call the gospel of work. I can't recall if Carlyle himself ever actually uses this phrase, but the idea is largely attributed to him. So Carlyle is writing, so even though he writes a lot about, you know, about God and faith here, right? He's not talking about conventional Christian belief. What he is talking about is faith in an idea and faith in action. And this is where this idea of the gospel of work comes in, right? So part of his argument is that the traditional institutions that we rely on for meaning are by the 1830s failing. They're not giving us 
what we need. And you have the, our educational institutions, our religious institutions, our political institutions. We're not getting from them the things we ought to be getting from. We're not getting meaning from them. So we need to find meaning in individual action. through meaningful work. Feeling lost? Feeling troubled? Feeling empty inside? You should be working. And by work, he doesn't necessarily mean like going out and digging a trench, right? You know, he's not necessarily talking about physical labor. Um, you know, if writing is the kind of work you're more suited for, you should be doing that, right? If thinking is the kind of work you're most suited for, you should be doing that, right? But you need to find the work that best suits you and put your shoulder to the boulder, right? That's the basic idea, that what we're going to find meaning in is meaningful work. Now, this particular text is also uh, built upon uh, what he calls his clothes philosophy. In fact, you know, the name Sartre Resarges means the tailor retailer, which refers to two things. It refers to, to Teufelsdruck's clothes philosophy. But also to the way the editor is stitching this narrative together out of all of these different little pieces that have been left in no particular order on his doorstep. So the philosophy of clothes states that philosophies and institutions are like suits of clothes. in two ways. One, they cover and protect the individual body. Or in the case of a philosophy, they cover and protect the soul. And over time, like a suit of clothes, they wear out. Right, you know, case in point, the, you know, the state of my shoes, right? Um, I walk a lot, um, so these are not looking so good these days. They don't protect my feet quite like they used to when I bought them. So, <clears throat> when you put on a suit of clothes, right, if you wear it too often, you wear it out. And eventually, you need to replace it with a new one, right? And one of the arguments that he is making here is that conventional Christianity itself is like one of these suits of clothes that by the early 1830s has worn out and needs to be replaced by something else, right? Um, he talks about this in the Everlasting Yay chapter, right? Is that, you know, 2,000 years is kind of a long time for any institution to last. And <clears throat> over time, you need something else, or you need a new suit of clothes to keep out the cold and to keep off the wet, right? He is also associated with what we call the great man theory of history. Does anybody know what this is? Has anybody ever heard of this before? This notion is not familiar to anyone? Okay. Um, well, let me ask you this. Uh, when you took history classes in high school and in elementary school, how much time did you spend learning about the actions of groups or whole societies, and how much time did you spend learning about the actions of single important individuals? 
Pardon? Or comments specifically. Okay, yeah, it's like, you know, George Washington did blah, 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 right? You know, Thomas Jefferson did blah, 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 um, so on and so forth, right? Yeah, um, so this shows the pervasive influence of the great man theory of history, right? The basic idea here is that history is moved through the actions of special or exceptionally powerful individuals. Carlyle doesn't put a lot of faith in groups. Um, he is not, for example, a fan of democracy um, because he believes that the vast majority of people need to be led. And they need to be led by these great leaders that emerge like a few in every generation, right? Um, and that simply letting the people's passions run riot um, is dangerous, that the people need to be controlled. Now, related to this is a faith in what is often called the myth of progress. Does everybody know what the myth of progress is as an idea of time? If you're a believer in progress, what do you assume about the relationship between each era and the one that came before it? Yeah, the things only get better, right? Now, Carlyle's beliefs about history are actually more complicated than this, but this is an idea that later thinkers will extract from his works and adapt into this notion that time only moves forward and things only get better with time. Right? That everything always bends towards um, you know, social improvement, whether it really does or not. So <clears throat> this is what's at the back of what Carlyle's arguing, right? Anti-utilitarian, pro-meaningful work, interested in finding you know, new philosophies to cover new situations, and a belief in the power of great individuals to move history, right? But in the everlasting no section, he's still stuck in these old lessons from the Hinterschlag Gymnasium and wandering around Europe uh, feeling passionately sad, right? So, <clears throat> let's look quickly here on page 38 and see if we see anything familiar in some of his descriptions um, of his uh, agony here, right? Putting, us, putting all which external and internal miseries together, may we not find in the following sentences, quite in our professor's still vain, significance enough? From suicide a certain aftershine, noxshine of Christianity withheld me, perhaps also a certain indolence of character. For was, that, was not that a remedy I had at any time within reach? Often, however, was there a question present to me. Should someone now, at the turning of that corner, blow thee suddenly out of space into the other world, or other no world, by pistol shot, how were it? On which ground, too, I have often, in sea storms and siege cities and other death scenes, exhibited an imperturbability which passed falsely enough for courage. Does this sound familiar at all? Does this sound like any character we have encountered in any recent texts? Okay, yeah, we're, we're, what's, what's it familiar from? Yeah, this sounds a lot like Winsy in The Mortal Immortal, right? When he's contemplating at the end of the story whether or not his body really is immortal. Right? Like, can I be killed? Should I try to commit suicide? 
Should I try some last daring action you know, that will serve mankind that might lead to my death? So Teufelsdruck in this everlasting no phase is like Whimsy, a kind of parody of that overreacher character, right? That we find in so much romantic writing. He's walking around looking at these uh, you know, magnificent vistas and feeling all these powerful feelings and battling within his breast against suicide, right? But he's unable to really do anything. All he does is go around and look at things and brood. Now, this particular character type is reminiscent of a poem by Lord Byron called Child Harold's Pilgrimage. In which a British aristocrat wanders around Europe basically looking at things and feeling passionate intensity, right? And brooding over his exile. But not really doing a whole hell of a lot. So for somebody who believes in the power of action more than in the power of thought or feeling, right? This is going to seem particularly silly. And so in this phase of his spiritual reawakening, right? Teufelsdruck does seem pretty ridiculous. I mean, he seems comic kind of throughout this, but yeah, in the, in the everlasting no phase, um, you know, mooning around um, over his lost love and complaining about how badly he's been treated by the world, but not doing anything about it. <clears throat> it's meant to seem ridiculous, right? Full of such humor, and perhaps the miserablest man in the whole French capital or suburbs, was I, one sultry dog day, after much perambulation, Toiling along the dirty little Rue Saint Thomas de l'Enfer, uh, the street of St. Thomas in hell, among civic rubbish enough, in a close atmosphere, and over pavements as hot as Nebuchadnezzar's furnace, whereby doubtless my spirits were a little cheered, when all at once there rose a thought in me, and I asked myself, What art thou afraid of? Now, I think the reference here, particularly to Nebuchadnezzar's furnace, is interesting. Does anybody remember the story in the Old Testament that this refers to? Or who Nebuchadnezzar was? Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar is a Babylonian king. During the period when the Israelites are, at least their elite, are in exile in Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar builds a golden idol and insists everyone in the city bow down to, right? And anybody who refuses to bow down is going to be tossed into the, into the furnace. And these three young Israelites, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refuse to bow down and are tossed into the furnace and are saved by some heavenly power, right? Now I think the part about them being saved by divine power is less important to Carlyle than the notion of resistance here, right? The notions of resistance to tyranny and the refusal to bow down to a false idol, right? That for him is what Nebuchadnezzar's furnace represents, especially when we see it coupled with the name of the street here, you know, you know St. Thomas in Hell. If we think about who St. Thomas is in the Gospels, what is St. Thomas most famous for among the apostles? What's the nickname he's given? Does anybody know? Doubting. Yeah, Doubting Thomas, right? 
He's the apostle who refuses to just take Jesus' word for it when he said, you know, to take the other's word for it, right? When you know, they, they when they say he's come, but Jesus has been risen from the grave, right? He's the one who has to see and touch before he'll believe it. And for Carlisle, I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing, right? That St. Thomas requires evidence. The belief, right? So what art thou afraid of? Wherefore, like a coward, dost thou forever pip and whimper and go cowering and trembling? Despicable biped, what is the sum total of the worst that lies before thee? Death? Well, death. And say the pangs of Tophet too, and all that the devil and man may, will, or can do against thee. Hast thou not a heart? Canst thou not suffer whatsoever it be? And as a child of freedom, though outcast, trample Tophet itself under thy feet while it consumes thee? Let it come then. I will meet it and defy it. And as I so thought, there rushed like a stream of fire over my whole soul, and I shook base fear away from me forever. I was strong, of unknown spirit, almost a god. Ever from that time, the temper of my misery was changed. Not fear or whining sorrow was it, but indignation and grim, fire-eyed defiance. So what's the realization that he comes to here as he's walking along thinking about Nebuchadnezzar's furnace? Yeah, well, can he can can one just say no to death? <laughs> yeah, that that's impossible, right? But what can he change in relation to death? Yes, exactly, right? I can't change the fact that I'm going to die, right? But I can adjust my attitude towards it, right? So, you know, what am I afraid of, right? What's the worst that can happen to me? Death? Burning in hell, right? Well, it's up to me how I feel about those things. I can choose to resist feeling fear or shame about those things. Thus had the everlasting no, does Ivica 9, peeled authoritatively through all the recesses of my being, of my me. Then it was that my whole me stood up in native God-created majesty, and with emphasis recorded its protest. Such a protest, the most important transaction in life May that same indignation and defiance in a psychological point of view be fitly called. The everlasting no had said, Behold, thou art fatherless, outcast, and the universe is mine, the devil's. To which my whole me now made answer, I am not thine, but free, and forever hate thee. So the everlasting no isn't something he says, right? The everlasting no is something he feels the world saying to him, right? The everlasting no had said, Behold, thou art fatherless, outcast, and the universe is the devil's. To which my whole me now made answer, I am not thine, but free and forever hate thee. What's that? Okay, so let's try and parse this a little bit, right? So the everlasting no is a denial of what, right? If the everlasting no says, Behold, thou art fatherless, outcast, and the universe is mine, what is that suggesting about your role within the universe? Can't do small. Yeah, you are tiny and powerless, and you are subject to these other forces that are way beyond your control, right? So why is he saying the universe is mine? He's not saying it. These, this is what he's a, these, are the, these are the words he's attributing to this force he calls the everlasting no, right? And this everlasting no is a kind of denial of life and freedom.
And his response to this, his response to the everlasting no, his protest is, I am not thine, but free and forever hate thee. Right? So the everlasting no is something that is said to him by the world, right? Not something that he says himself. What he says himself is this protest of his own freedom. Which leads him into what he calls the center of indifference. Right. Though after this Baphometic fire baptism of his, our wanderer signifies that his unrest was but increased. So he figures out that he's free, right? Or that makes this, this determination that he's free. By the way, does anybody have does anybody know what Baphomet is? Why he called why he refers to his Baphometic fire baptism? Um, it's a word that's used now, uh, almost as a synonym for a devil demon, right? Um, Baphomet was the idol that the Knights Templars were accused of worshiping in the Middle, a the Middle Ages, um, so that the Pope and the King of France could uh, burn them at the stake and seize their land. Um, but in 19th century occult philosophy, Baphomet becomes this being that represents a union of opposites. So the way Baphomet is typically depicted is as a kind of human-goat hybrid with masculine and feminine characteristics. So human and animal, man and woman, right? Opposites contained in one being. So I think that is the context in which the text is using this particular figure, right? You know, much as the name Diogenes Teufelsdruck is a kind of union of opposites, right? So the problem, so this, the whole center of indifference issue here, right, is like, what's the problem with total freedom? If you've declared your total freedom that no one can control you or tell you what to do, how can that be difficult at first? You don't have something that drives you. Yeah. Where do you go? What do you do? What drives you, right? You have to figure that out for yourself now. And so this chapter um, is a discussion primarily of wandering, right? And looking for meaning. in cities, in fields, and in various examples of human accomplishment, right? So there's a part here that I want to look at. Uh, there are these two paragraphs, uh, starting on page 41, where he talks about war. No less satisfactory is the sudden appearance not in battle, yet on some battlefield, which we soon gather must be that of Wagram. So that here, for once, is a certain approximation to the distinctness of, uh, distinctness of date. Omitting much, let us impart what follows. So before we dig too deeply into this, one thing I want to remind everybody is that this is written first published around 1830. The Napoleonic Wars end in 1815. So Carlyle is writing this piece during a time of comparative peace and rebuilding, right? After um, about 15 years of war. Horrible enough. A whole march field strewed with shell splinters, cannon shot, ruined tumbrils, and dead men and horses. Stragglers still remaining not so much as buried. And those red mold heaps, aye, there lie the shells of men out of which all the life and virtue has been blown. 
And now are they swept together and crammed down out of sight like blown eggshells? Did nature, when she bade the Donau bring down his mold cargo from the Corinthian and Carpathian heights and spread them out here into the softest, richest level, intend thee, O Marchfeld, for a corn-bearing nursery whereon her children might be nursed, or for a cockpit wherein they might be the more uh, commodiously throttled and tattered? Were thy three broad highways, meeting here from the ends of Europe, made for ammunition wagons then? Were thy Wagrams and Stilfreeds, but still so, but so many ready-built casemates, were in the house of Habsburg, might batter with artillery, and with artillery be battered? König Otakar, amid yonder hillocks, dies under Rodolphe's truncheon. Here Kaiser Franz falls a swoon under Napoleon's, within which five centuries, to omit the others, how has thy breast fair plain been defaced and defiled? The greensward is torn up and trampled down. Man's fond care of it, his fruit trees, hedgerows, and pleasant dwellings, blown away with gunpowder. And the kind seed field lies a desolate, hideous place of skulls. Nevertheless, nature is at work. Neither shall these powder devilkins with their utmost devilry gainsay her. But all that gore and carnage will be shrouded in, absorbed into manure. And next year the Marchfeld will be green, nay greener. Thrifty, unwearied nature, ever out of our great waste, adducing some little profit of thy own, how dost thou from the very carcass of the killer bring life for the living? So this is a pretty lengthy description of a battlefield, right? But is this place just a battlefield? And indeed, you know, nature doesn't intend for anything to be a battlefield, right? So we have this site of what Teufelsdruck seems to regard as this massive human waste, right? This enormous waste of energy and time and life that nature then converts into something good and useful and beautiful, right? Given time to heal, nature takes all of this carnage and will turn it essentially into corn, right? It'll nourish a new generation of people descended from those who fought there. Until, of course, it gets trampled down again by the, by the next war party. But <clears throat> what Teufelsdruck is seeing here is a kind of resilience in nature and a kind of efficiency in nature and nature making use of what it is given even when the products it's given are ugly and hideous and the result of stupidity. Now along this whole you know, theme of stupidity here, right, what, speaking in, in unoffi quite unofficial language, is the net purport and upshot of war. To my own knowledge, for example, there dwell and toil in the British village of Dumdrudge usually some 500 souls. From these, by certain natural enemies of the French, they are successively selected during the French War, say, 30 able-bodied men. Dumdrudge, at her own expense, has suckled and nursed them. She has not without difficulty and sorrow fed them up to manhood and even trained them to crafts so that one can weave, another build, another hammer, and the weakest can stand under 30 stone at hors de plot. Nevertheless, Amid much weeping and swearing, they are selected, all dressed in red, and shipped away at the public charges some 2,000 miles, or say only to the south of Spain, and fed there till wanted. And now to that same spot in the south of Spain are 30 similar French artisans from a French dumb drudge, in like manner wending, till, at length, after infinite effort, the two parties come into actual juxtaposition, and 30 stands fronting 30, each with a gun in his hand. Straight away the word fire is given, and they blow the souls out of one another. And in place of 60 brisk, useful craftsmen, the world has 60 dead carcasses, which it must bury, and a new shed tears for. Had these men any quarrel? Busy as the devil is not the smallest. They lived far enough apart, were the entire strangers, nay, in so wide a universe there was even unconsciously, by commerce, some mutual helpfulness between them. So what kind of picture are we getting of war from this? 
of the nature of war. Wasteful. Yeah, this is a terrible waste, right? Here are 60 men, 30 from one country, 30 from another, who have no problem with each other, who have been trained to do useful things in their own home villages, but they've been sent to fight each other and then there's nothing left, right? So you've taken people who were useful and through war taken them out of the world. How then, Simpleton, their governors had fallen out and instead of shooting one another, had the cunning to make these poor blockheads shoot, right? So essentially, war is something that is the result of bad government. Right. War <coughs> results from the stupidity of the people who rule a country, playing on the patriotism or feelings of nationalism of ordinary folk um, who otherwise would just stay at home and continue to practice their useful crafts. So <clears throat> in this center of indifference section, we see this kind of like balance kind of like pushing and pulling back and forth of Teufelsdruck um, trying on different philosophies, right? Like on the one hand, admiring nature for what it makes out of war, that of the raw materials of war, but at the same time then abhorring humanity and human government for causing wars in the first place um, and <clears throat> rendering people useless. Now, <clears throat> I want to note uh, where he runs into um, the Russian smuggler on page 44, and what conclusions are to be drawn from that here as well, right? Silence as a death right he. For midnight, even the Arctic latitudes has its character. Nothing but the granite cliffs ruddy tinged, the peaceable gurgle of that slow heaving polar ocean over which in the utmost north the great sun hangs low and lazy as if he too were slumbering. Yet is his cloud couch wrought of crimson and cloth of gold, yet does his light stream over the mirror of waters like a tremulous fire pillar, shooting downwards to the abyss and hide itself under my feet. In such moments, solitude is also invaluable, for who would speak or be looked on when behind him lies all Europe and Africa, fast asleep except the watchman? And before him, the silent immensity and palace of the eternal, or of our sun is but a porch lamp. So we see here an appreciation for the sublime, right? This is a sublime landscape, a sublime vista that he's looking out over. Um, he's creating a lovely picture. He's drinking it all in. And then, nevertheless, in this solemn moment comes a man or monster scrambling from among the rock hollows. And Shaggy, huge as the hyperborean bear, hails me in Russian speech, most probably, therefore, a Russian smuggler. With courteous brevity, I signify my indifference to contraband trade, my humane intentions, yet strong wish to be private. In vain, the monster counting doubtless on his superior stature and minded to make sport for himself, or perhaps profit, were it with murder, continues to advance. Ever assailing me with his importunate train oil breath, and now has advanced till we stand both on the verge of the rock the deep sea rippling greedily down below. What argument will avail? On the thick hyperborean, cherubic reasoning, seraph seraphic eloquence were lost. Prepared for such extremity, I deftly enough whisk aside one step, draw out from my interior reservoirs a sufficient Birmingham horse pistol, and say, be so, as obliging, to, be so obliging as to retire, friend, and with promptitude. This logic, even the hyperborean understands, Fast enough, with apologetic petitionary growl, he sidles off, and except for suicidal as well as homicidal purposes, need not return. 
Such I hold to be the genuine use of gunpowder, that it makes all men alike tall. Nay, if thou be cooler, cleverer than I, if thou have more mind, though all but no body whatever, then canst thou kill me first, and are the taller. Hereby, at last, is the Goliath powerless and the David resistless. Savage animalism is nothing. Inventive spiritualism is all. So, what he's getting at here is probably a little bit confusing. But <clears throat> I think where the meat of this is, in this notion, he says, you know, the gunpowder makes all men alike tall. And he's not really even just talking about guns or about weapons here. He's talking about machines. So by the time Carlyle is writing this, the Industrial Revolution is well underway, right? We've talked a little bit about romantic uh, resistance to this and kind of like ignoring the context of industrialism. You know, these guys are writing, you know, writing poetry up in the lake country um, when, you know, just a few miles to the south in Lancashire there are all these factories popping up, right? But life in Britain has by this point been revolutionized in various ways by a series of inventions, right? <sighs> On the one hand, you have mass industrialization. Which is made possible by James Watt's invention of the first efficient steam engine, uh, completed and perfected in 1775. These machines, these steam engines, are then used to power things like spinning jennies, invented in 1764, uh, which can turn um, the raw materials of fabric, you know, things like you know, wool, flax, whatnot, into thread. And the power loom. invented in 1787 in the first modern factories, which, are, which start popping up around 1777, right? So essentially what the steam engine allows is we're kind of taking this, what used to be skilled work, right, that had to be done by a craftsperson and putting in the hands of anyone who can afford to buy the machine, right? Or anyone who works the machine. So you can have a room full of unskilled workers working this machine, simply turning out all of this fabric, all of this material, right? You've also got revolutions in transportation and communication that essentially bend space, right? You know, we for, because they're normal to us, we forget how revolutionary the steamship, right, first transatlantic steamship was built in 1813, and the railroad really were. Suddenly you could get where you were going a lot more quickly and usually a lot more safely. Right? Parts of the country that were distant from each other were now hooked, were now hooked up together. Um, you could travel at greater speeds with greater reliability. And the telegraph, invented in 1837, made it easier to communicate over long distances. So the idea of gunpowder making all men alike tall, right? But, you know, this gives David power over Goliath, right? What Carlyle is really arguing here is that 
the wave of the future is the machine. And that those who can take control of the machines will topple the wasteful old aristocratic Goliaths, right? The old idols will fall to the new idols. As automation and industrialization make everything easier and make what used to be luxuries available to everyone. So this is the positive face of the Industrial Revolution, right? We'll talk about the negative face in sub subsequent sections, and the negative face, and there is a very, very ugly side of all of this, right? But Carlyle is focused more on the possibilities of this. Especially for raising up a kind of new aristocracy of captains of industry who will get there through work, right? So does anybody have any questions so far? Everybody good? Everybody with me? Is any of this starting to make a little bit more sense? Okay, yeah, and I think like this is the thing, like, like in order to really get Carlisle, you do kind of need a lot of context, right? Um, and once you know what's going on, I mean, the language is still a little bit thick and uh, uh, thorny, but <clears throat> it becomes a little easier. Right? So let's look then at the uh, everlasting yay, right? So the center of indifference section he compares here in this first sentence to temptations in the wilderness, right? So the Christ trial, period of trial of about 40 days in the wilderness, right? Temptations in the wilderness, exclaims Teufelsdruck. Have we not all been tried with such? Not so easily can the old Adam, lodged in us by birth, be dispossessed. Our life is compassed round with necessity. Yet is the meaning of life itself no other than freedom, than voluntary force? Thus we have a warfare in the beginning, especially a hard-fought battle. For the God-given mandate, work thou in well-doing, lies mysteriously written, in Promethean prophetic characters in our hearts, and leaves us no rest, night or day, till it be deciphered and obeyed, till it burn forth in our conduct a visible, acted gospel of freedom. And as the clay-given mandate, eat thou and be fulfilled, at the same time persuasively proclaims itself through every nerve, must not there be a confusion, a contest, before the better influence can become the effort. Now he talks about Promethean prophetic characters. Do you guys know who Prometheus was? He was around the time of Aristotle. Uh, Prometheus is not a real person. <laughs> yes, yes, good. Yeah, Prometheus was um, a titan who stole fire from the gods and brought it to human beings um, to make their lives easier, right? So Prometheus um, is this kind of um, rebel benefactor figure. Who is very important symbolically for the later generation of Romantics and the early generation of Victorians, right? So the Romantics tend to emphasize the rebellion part of Prometheus's, um, <clears throat> Prometheus's character, right? This is a guy who gives a great big middle finger to Zeus, right? You know, he you know, says, fuck you to the gods, and he steals fire, and he gives it to human beings even though he's not supposed to. The Victorians, rather are more interested in the benefactor part of this, right? Then, you know, through Prometheus' efforts and his martyrdom, right? He is able to give human beings the means of survival and the means of, you know, possible invention, right? Carlyle is interested in both of these aspects. So he's Carlyle himself is kind of a bridge figure between the Romantics and the Victorians. So both of these are important to him.
the rebel part is associated with that protest against the everlasting no. And the benefactor part is associated with this last portion, the everlasting yea, right? So, if we look on page 50, he gives us a defini his definition of the everlasting yea. As looked at mere ein, I see a glimpse of it, he cries elsewhere. There is in man a higher, a higher than the love of happiness. He can do without happiness, and instead thereof find blessedness. Was it not to preach forth this same higher that sages and martyrs, the poet and the priest, in all times have spoken and suffered, bearing testimony through life and through death of the godlike that is in man, and how in the godlike only he has strength and freedom? Which God-inspired doctrine art thou honored to be taught, O heavens, and broken with manifold merciful afflictions, even till thou become contrite and learned, O oh, thank thy destiny for these. Thankfully bear what yet remain, thou hadst need of them. The self in thee needed to be annihilated. By benignant fever paroxysms is life rooting out the deep-seated chronic diseases and triumphs over death. On the roaring billows of time, thou art not engulfed, but borne aloft into the azure of eternity. Love not pleasure, love God. This is the everlasting yea, wherein all contradiction is solved, wherein whoso walks and works, it is well with him. Okay, so this is a lot of wind, right? <laughs> there is a lot of purple prose here. But we can, I think, boil this down by tracing it back to the profit and loss philosophy that he criticizes in the everlasting no, right, the beginning of that, right? What is the key tenet of that profit and loss philosophy? What is the most important thing to a utilitarian? How much pleasure would you provide? Yeah, so essentially, usefulness is defined as happiness, right? Usefulness is defined as pleasure. And so what is Carlyle arguing is more important? than pleasure. Does pleasure actually matter all that much? Pleasure does not give meaning, right? He says, love not pleasure, love God. This is the everlasting yea, wherein all contradiction is solved. Wherein whoso walks and works, it is well with him, right? So this everlasting yea, as we sort of see through the way this develops, is again, like, like he, you know, he mentions the love of God, but he's really talking, again, more about faith in an idea, an action, right? This gospel of work, this individual action through meaningful work. Throw off the old clothes, put on the new ones. Okay, so... We're at about time here. Like, I really hope that I have helped you understand what's going on here, uh, because I know that this is a difficult text, which is why I decided not to give you a quiz on it. Because um, yeah, I didn't want to penalize people for something, you know, for misunderstanding something that was this difficult, right? Um, so <clears throat> there will be terms from this on the uh, on the vocab quiz. Um, I might ask you who Diogenes Teufel's Drick is, right? I might ask you about some of these things as well. So just make sure that you, you know, that you've got these, partly because these are key ideas that are going to animate a lot of Victorian thought, which is, again, the main reason we read Sartre and Sartre's. Okay, so I've got reading questions for you for next time. My collection of rags is in the laundry, so I will wipe down the desks as you leave today. And we'll see you Monday. <laughs>